think about that, that's 250 year old string right there. For me, it's just like, it's the history that really gets me so much. God, that's so cool. That is amazing. So amazing. Welcome back, guys. Thanks for joining us. By us, I mean me and Ernie, my dog down there, in case you hear any dog sounds. I should date this video because it's fun and because uh, one of the books will be 300 years old in, or it's a map, this one in particular, next year. It's July 13th, 2022, and uh, not only will this book be or this map, one of them, be 300 years old next year. Um, I will have actually had all of these packages for over a year, some of them a year and a half at this point, waiting on my shelf to be unboxed for this exact moment. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, we have about probably 20 packages, books, maps. There's a couple... Uh, comic books and other things thrown in the mix and I think it'll be a fun little uh, unboxing video so join me join us and um, let's see what we find out I should redo that let's find out what's in the box all right here we go number one and uh, I covered up the addresses mine and the return um, but here, I left the place of, you know, where it was sent from. So, Green Bay, Wisconsin, for this one. And I got a nifty little... slide razor here we're gonna use to open the packages and I'm sorry about the uh, the band-aid I feel like I constantly have little band-aids on in all my videos but um, it's just a minor cut kind of like these just uh, doing from doing little house projects tis but a flesh wound I'm sure you guys I promise, just a just a minor flesh wound. Okay. This is an astronomy book. Here we go. Only a dollar ninety-five. I'm pretty sure I paid more than that. Astronomy made simple. Yeah, so this is definitely one of the newer books. I got this really because I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to have a, an introductory astronomy book. And uh, yeah. See here, 1955, 1963, Double Day and Company, Double Day and Company. We have a brief history, and it's really what this is, yeah. Just an intro introduction to astronomy and all its facets. So. So 
be a good reference book in the future. And I have every intention of finishing up my Strong the Planets video. I'll at least be doing the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Um, and I might, you know, if, if you guys enjoy it, I'll, I'll continue with the gas giants and ice giants. But, uh, yeah, part of me, part of the appeal of these, you know, increasingly older books throughout this video were, I do have an astronomy book, um, that's not the 300 year old one, but it is, let's see, I got a list of my eBay transactions up here. Anyways, it's over 200 years old, so... It's fascinating just to watch the change in knowledge that we've got in the past, you know, as the decades go by. And what we knew, you know, two, 250 years ago versus 1950 versus now. Uh, it's, you know, I said it's July 13th, 2022. Uh, James Webb Space Telescope just... They just released the first images of that amazing piece of technology. Billion dollars, billions of dollars went into that. Um, and I guess decades of planning and development. So that's something I definitely want to make a video on soon. Number two, I'm sure I'm going to lose count, so I'm not going to pretend to be able to keep up with that. This one's from Winslow, Arkansas. Winslow, Arkansas. Just move my cord real quick so I don't keep bumping into them. Can I do that? Does that work? Let's check this one out. And now, a couple of these, especially these uh, thinner packages here are uh, some are magazine or yeah magazines but also comics and uh, it's a couple of newer items but um, we're going to be getting into some very old books as well so because I uh, <laughs> I'm not really aware of which one I'm opening and which one you know, what order I'm opening them in. Didn't want you guys to think I was pulling a fast one on you. A four hour fast one. Slowest fast one I ever saw. Okay. Ah, here we go. So this is a comic. And I want to give a shout out my friend Chicho. Uh, just, I just like that guy. Um, he does a lot of uh, Chicho. That's C H Y C H O. I know I shout him out a lot, I guess. But he's worth mentioning. He's the one who got me into. Uh, I'm not even particularly into comic books, but I used to have a few, and. Um, really just for nostalgia and for collecting them um, you know I don't know if I'll ever resell them but um, I thought it was cool that you know I, I see the value in these books and this one was a pretty old one where do we find the year on it so Marvel 25th anniversary right there um there we go. 1984. Right there. So, um, yeah, not not the oldest thing going, but uh, but uh, a nice little Wolverine comic from the Uncanny X-Men. Um, I just <laughs> the advertisements, of course always interesting to look back on M&M's 
So I guess they always kind of had those little M&Ms with, uh, you know, Pixar-like eyes on them. This ad's from 1985, Mars Bars, Mars Incorporated. I wonder if Mars still owns M&Ms. Um, but yeah, anyways, Chicho is the one who uh, I enjoy watching his. He does a lot of, he's a very um, knowledgeable and, and a huge collector of comic books. So he does a lot of unboxings and um, he even does comic book readings on his channel. If you guys are interested in that, I highly recommend checking him out. comic books muscles in seven days it's funny all right so we'll go through that some other time i'm sure i did not see the i did not see the message that's given there that's kind of sad but uh anyways i guess that's uh responsible it's good that the message is out there. That's really awkward, though. That's the first thing that I turned over to, and I didn't notice it. I gotta do some maneuvering around of the packages. So just sit tight and listen to Ernie Scratch while I uh, do that. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I moved the packages <laughs> to get them all in that one shot. They were kind of precariously positioned on the bed there. Got a bed behind me. Okay, all right, let's check this one out here. This was from Kansas City, Missouri, Missouri. Um, this was one of the ones that I opened to just check the condition of. I just wanted to make sure it was doing all right, and it, uh, it appears like it did. Let's check it out. So here is our first really old book. Look at that. No, oh, it goes this way. Look at that. It says Historia Universal. Now I think this book is in French. Look at that binding. Wow. You can see the leather. That is amazing. Look how well they made books. And I can, oh, you know, it's over about 200 years old. We'll check it out in just a second. But I mean, I can only assume this is real leather and, uh, just so quality. some uh, gold gold trim something I'm not really sure what to call it it's really really something to hold to look at and and then to actually hold these books it's a whole different ball of wax Man, 
just hear that thunder. So, discourse sous la histoire universelle. I need to get the French whisper to uh, interpret this for me. But that's millennia, so that's a thousand. A D means 500. So 1500 plus two centuries, 1700 plus three decades, 1738. 1738. Wow. It's really something. So this one, obviously, I won't even be able to read it. Maybe I'll maybe I'll gift it to French Whisper. He can do a video on it, but uh, see if it has any folios or images in it. No, I don't. I don't see any. Yeah, see, I don't even really want to open the book because you can see it's just opening it starts to crease the spine. So I don't even want to do that. Um, we have quite a few more books to look look at and unbox. So we'll go ahead and just set this one aside. But uh, it's our first first book from the 1700s. This might be the, the second oldest book that we have. So man, that's something. You know what, I'll just I'll leave that one right there. Go. Let's check this one out from the UK. The UK mainland. Canterbury, Kent, the UK. So this looks like one I can uh, just rip open here, so I'm going to dispense with the cuttery. So this is another pretty old book, I believe. <laughs> so we got a advertisement. Bookaddiction.co.uk Seductive Merchants of the Mind Beautiful books. It's not a bad addiction to have, I guess. It's not too bad. I'll tell you what else isn't too bad is this packaging here. Look at this. Look at that. Man. Yeah, just get this out of the way. Okay, this is uh, pretty amazing. Let's see what it says there. Shaw's Fables. I wanted to buy a book that was, uh, you know, I wanted to buy Grimm's Fairy Tales, Fables, the Grimm Brothers, but uh, they were way too expensive, so <laughs> I settled for Shaw's. Let's hope it's comparable. So 
I had to uh, cover up some private information there, but um, on the front, they were kind enough to, uh, I'm going to have to leave these guys a really good review if um, they were on eBay. No, I guess Abe Books, there it is. Um, I still have to go back because this is so well packaged, so nice. said, um, this was actually Francis Bacon, Fables of the Ancients in Philosophy, Morality, and whatever. It's 146 pages, many black and white wood engravings, including the frontispiece of Francis Bacon by H.R. Cook, leather-covered boards with gilt lettering, I guess that's the word I was looking for. Talking about the uh, the gilt gilding on the sides, the front edges earlier. Corners turned in and rear corners slightly torn. Some foxing on the preliminary pages. New edition with notes critical and explanatory by Dr. Shaw. Awesome. Let's open her up. even nicer. Let's put the other one next to it. I should maybe tuck this thing in. It's so nice. just shines off that shiny leather. It's a little blemish or dark spot right there. I cannot get enough of these old books. These are the coolest things to hold and to collect. And I know they're constantly increasing in price, but, uh, whoo, some more thunder. Um, you know, most of these were under $50. Some you get for 20 30 40 Ernie's a little nervous. He hates thunder. He really gets scared. So you gotta make sure. Actually, let me, let me lay. He's sitting on the other side of the room. Um, let me go let him sit under my feet here so he feels a little more secure. But, um, yeah, I'd highly recommend you guys check. I'm sure these, some of these videos that I've done, a couple of them have gotten real popular, so maybe it's increased the price of some of these books if 
you know, it sends more people out looking, but, um, for me, it's a, it's a very worthwhile, um, expense. It's really an investment, almost, you know. Ernie, come here, buddy. fables has to offer us. I guess I'll put this one back. Back over here for now. And I don't know if that says a hundred or pounds, but I definitely didn't pay a hundred for this. Fables of the Ancients in Philosophy, Morality, and Civil Policy Illustrated and Explained by Francis Bacon Francis Bacon was... There's Roger Bacon who... I guess lived in the 1300s? I know Francis Bacon was a couple hundred years later. I'm, maybe they were related, but... Um, he was one of the first people to, um, you know, like many geniuses of ages more than a hundred years ago, um, he was a, like a polymath, he was an expert in multiple uh, disciplines and domains, so I know he was a scientist, an early, he was one of the earliest scientists, he was a, a philosopher, as told in this book, he was a scholar of ancient texts, like many people, he probably knew multiple languages, probably even knew ancient Latin, here's a picture of him right here, Francis Bacon, Lord High Chancellor of England, and I know he... <laughs> To say the, to say the, uh, not the least of his um, undertakings was a very, a, as we just read there, Lord High Chancellor of England. He was a very accomplished politician in England. I don't know when it was, the 1500s? Maybe? book right here is from 1803 and I really wanted to uh, get a a book about mythology and fables Listen to this writing, I guess, um, with notes critical and explanatory by Dr. Shaw, so I guess maybe it's a translation by Francis Bacon. He was, Bacon was Baron Verulam, Viscount St. Albans, and Lord High Chancellor of England.
London, London, printed by J. Cundy, Ivy Lane, for Miss, for M. Jones, Paternoster Row. The opening preface here says the present production appears like a rich cabinet of antiques opened and set in view. The happy talent which the author in his physical works employs to interpret nature is here employed to interpret the dark oracles of men. As the rain comes down heavier outside. And to say the truth, he seems to have used the like artifice in both, proceeding according to the inductive method delivered in the second part of the Novum Organum, without which of or something of the kind, it would not be easy to derive such depths of knowledge from the enigmas or dark parables of antiquity. For example, he first calls out his fable with choice judgment, choice and judgment, and then trims or prunes it, rejecting what is superfluous or spurious. Next it turns and views it in different lights, and at length finds out the key for deciphering it in the most natural and advantageous manner. And thus, having got the right end of the thread, the interpretation follows as it were spontaneously. Though the whole still remains to be coolly sate upon and revised, in order to discover if the imagination has not been too busy in uh, working off the interpretation, or if no levity misbecoming the ancient sages has encrept in. And as the author certainly bestowed this, or perhaps with uh, much greater diligence and application in trimming these ancient fables and fitting them with suitable interpretations, it seems but a piece of justice in the reader that he be not over hasty to pronounce upon the performance. This is mentioned, this is mentioned the rather because some have thought that the author here employed his imagination more than his judgment. But the appeal from men's first thoughts to their second is the privilege of every careful writer. The appeal from men's first thoughts to their second is the privilege of every careful writer. Yeah, it's a... Uh, I love that they you know, approach this with caution and they approach it as transmitted wisdom and not just children's you know inconsequential uh, superficial literature it's pretty awesome critique upon the mythology of the ancients the earliest antiquity lies buried in silence and oblivion Accepting the remains we have of it in sacred writ. Man, how's that for an opening line? That is amazing. I would love, love to do a video on this in the future. So, if you guys want to look in further into Sean's fables in the future, just let me know. And that goes for any of these books, um, with the exception of this one in French, which I will gladly ship over to uh, the French Whisperer, if he'd like to do a video on it. Because we have some religion, some history, mythology, like we have here, 
and we also have science and astronomy and some uh, philosophy as well so hopefully ideally I'll be able to make videos on many of these books actually so yeah in so many more ways than one they are an investment they're well worth the cost of you know 30 40 50 even a hundred dollars sometimes I mean it's it's so amazing to hold something 200 and as we'll see you know beyond that 300 years old just see you know not only are the author's words preserved in the text for all time as long as it exists but the um you know the actual physical book itself who you know it just carries so much mystery how many hands has this been in long dead hands and how many more hands will it see in the future you know, I just realized the uh, there's engravings in it so we can check those out real quick And this book seems to be small enough where we won't ruin the, the binding if we, um, my band-aid's coming off, if we, uh, you know, open it up a little bit. So here's one. You can see it's left, the ink has rubbed off on the page. I don't know whether that happens over time or if that happened right away. The Fable of Orpheus. I would love to just simply read this book. I'm sure it would be extremely um, just fun. Here we have Prometheus being eternally eaten alive by a vulture while he's chained to a cliff. And then reborn or revived like Wolverine. What a picture of agony. The fable of Prometheus explained of an overruling providence and of human nature. The ancients relate that man was the work of Prometheus. The fable of Memnon. Memnon. There's a funeral pyre there, someone being burnt alive, or not alive, I would guess. Unless that's part of the fable, I've never read that one. Fable of Cyclops' Death. Okay. We still have quite a few more books to get through, so let's dive into the, the next one. Here we go. This one's a little bit louder, so.
Hmm. Well, that was... I don't know if it's synchronous, but... It's at least uh, relevant or serendipitous, I guess. That the that the uh, next book I would have pulled out was Carl Jung's The Basic Writings of Carl Gustav Jung. Yeah, and this, um, I, I just, I'm, I spread myself so thin trying to, uh, trying to learn about so many different topics that I find, uh, well, I just, I'm, I'm an amateur. I'm so ignorant. I, I like trying to start with uh, primers and overviews and summaries and then you know from there I'll discover what I might want to look further into and explore you know more so Carl Jung is definitely someone who is becoming increasingly interesting for his well just really when I said about the fables there's so much wisdom packed into these these stories that can be broken down and, and dove into on, on so many layers at an intellectual level, a moral level, um, a societal level. And then yet at the same time, they're sophisticated enough to be able to have all that information packed into them, yet be um, easily you know, very memorable, easily transmissible, mimetic, in that sense. So, this, uh, this is the, really just the most, what this particular editor, Violet de Laszlo, Deems the most important works from Carl Jung. Symbols of transformation. Yeah, he he was a prolific writer. So I, I bought one or two of his books and tried to read them. They seem um, digestible at first until you really start to think about them, and then you realize. There's so many layers, there's so much he's he's packing into his own books. And he has such a wealth of knowledge of history and myth and religion and philosophy and science too, really. Um, that I realized I need I need uh I need to narrow my my uh attention, I guess. I needed some some help guiding myself through this guy's works, so that's what this was. But um, I'm interested in him just because I really want to know, you know, what wisdom we have out there. It was cool. I uh, I'm a fan of Jack Johnson, the musician, and I found out that he. Um, he reads, well, he reads a lot, but, uh, Joseph Campbell, one of Jung's students, or at least someone who got a lot of his ideas and inspiration from Carl Jung, um, was someone Jack Johnson got a lot of inspiration from, and I, I really found a lot of depth in, um, in Jack Johnson's lyrics. He's not very shallow at all. He's very, uh, he's just very articulate and very, he's easy to listen to in, in that interesting way, again, where you can listen to it as, like, a child could listen to his songs, because they're not abrasive, they're very family-friendly, yet they pack a lot of wisdom in them, and he, uh, he, he's timeless, his music is timeless, because it, 
has a lot of reverence for specifically he's from Hawaii so the Hawaiian culture and the uh, the wisdom that comes along with that but also Western culture more more broadly so it's interesting little connections there but he uh, he got a lot of inspiration from the the way Joseph Campbell interpreted mythology so this next book here is from pretty close to me Sanford Florida Central Florida it's near Orlando there so didn't have to travel too far to make it my way maybe we can access it through the back here use this little guy Nice, neat little packaging here. And again, I don't <laughs> remember what any of these packages contain specifically. I have a general idea of which, you know, which books I've had coming, but uh, honestly, it's been over a year at this point, so some I honestly forgot. But if I bought them, they must have been worthwhile. <laughs> That's all I can hope. some weight to it. Let's put our box down. Another uh, nicely packaged book. This one's this one's in cellophane, but still nicely wrapped up, nice and neat. It's nice to see. This might be the history of Christianity, and if I recall, let me look it up here. Might be able to see what year. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so yeah, Edward Gibbon, who I believe was the guy who wrote the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Let's see. Anyways, um, yeah, this is another thing I'm very interested in, is the, you know, this is a, until recently, central role of Christianity in Western culture means that, again, many works of literature are, th these are myths that are very deep and rich in meaning and wisdom, and I... Personally, I would like to know more about them. 
And then the history of Christianity itself tells me more about, well, where, how this, how society has um, shaped itself as it's been informed and as it's interpreted and, uh, yeah, been informed by Christianity. This really is so cool to be able to look at these old, old books. I mean, this one isn't even, you know, 150 years old. Let's see. Phrases that are commonly used in correspondence. Interesting. Now, my last really old book video, I had you guys help me decipher what these messages on here were. Let's see if I can figure it out myself. James S. McKinley. It's harder to tell on camera, actually. Can't tell what's easier for you guys. Bought from Chas B. Reynolds, February 3rd, 1889. <laughs> Don't want to dox him, but uh, I guess. I guess he probably wouldn't mind. 137 East 3rd Street. handwriting right there. That's such beautiful handwriting. This is USA. I can't really read what else that says. Some names. like the pages are coming out a little bit here. Oh, there we go. I guess they repeated it. <laughs> Look at that. Someone did the math of how old the book was in 1915. Right before World War I. Wow. That is something right there. So if we do the math. From there, it's uh, another hundred, another hundred and seven years, so one hundred and thirty-three, is it? One hundred and thirty-three years old. Wow, it's pretty beautiful. I love that. So this is a. History of Edward Gibbon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is the same guy who wrote The Rise and Fall. Yeah, The History and Decline. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. In a vindication, let's see, comprising all that relates to the progress. History of Christianity comprising all that relates to the progress of the Christian religion. In the history and decline, history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. 
in a vindication of some passages in the 15th and 16th chapters by Edward Gibbon Esquire with A Life of the Author, preface and notes by the editor, including Varium, Varium Notes by Guzzo, Wink Millman, an English churchman, <laughs> just an anonymous, random English churchman, and other scholars. New York, Peter Eckler, Fulton Street. This is really something. So, I guess 1887, if that's the year that this was printed, then it's 130, uh, 135 years old. 87, 35, yeah. Yeah, this, uh, this is honestly a book I want to read. I don't know if I will because it's so old. But, uh, again, this is amazing to have this history in my hands right here. I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful. And it, it's doubly cool because it's a historically important book it's old enough to be history now and it's about history it's the wolf of the capital Romulus and Remus the founders of Rome were the sons of Rhea Silvia and Mars Silvia was the daughter of Numitor and a Vestal Virgin for violating her vows of chastity, she and her twin offspring were condemned to be drowned in the Tiber. The cradle in which the children were exposed were, uh, were exposed being stranded. They were found and suckled by a she-wolf, which carried them to her den, where they were ultimately discovered by Faustulus, Faustulus, the king, the king's shepherd. This is awesome. Um, and I've never <laughs> read. I know more about books than than the books I've read, but uh, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is a like a pivotal historical series that uh, is, you know, I'm sure it's been preceded or or you know anteceded and um, replaced many years ago as a a work of you know eminent scholarship but it in its day and for a long time after I know it was a you know the go-to book to um, learn about Roman history so it's really really something to have this All right, so let's open another. This one comes to us from Boston, Massachusetts. Maybe I'll just try to cut along the tape here.
So look that like they uh, looks like they wrapped it in newspaper. <laughs> Luckily for me, it's getting a little too close with the razor there. I'm, maybe I'll I'll go ahead and switch to the scissors next time. Or right now, let's try it out. in frame because it looks cool but uh, I'm running out of space up here wow here we go so the leather leather on this uh, binding here is way more worn out than the other two books or the other three no I guess two because this doesn't look like it's real leather Ernie what's the matter buddy What's the matter, big guy? You want to take a break? Do you want to go outside? Of course you do. All right. I'm going to take Ernie outside for a minute. All right, we are back from outside. In fact, it's the next day. We uh, took a nice long break. <laughs> and... Uh, Ernie's refreshed and relaxed, peacefully sleeping on the floor again. So let's find out what's uh, what this book is. I guess it's probably upside down, isn't it? And uh, well, one thing I just realized is that I wasn't telling you guys the price I paid for these books and uh, because I, I got my eBay account up if I got it on eBay I'll try to look it up and uh, just let you guys know because most of these they were pretty reasonably priced you can see here this one has a, a ton of splotching and all that well, and in fact the whole cover comes off so much hate for uh, touching, putting my grubby fingers all over these books, but I don't know. It's part of the experience, I guess. Get touching the books, not getting the hate. <laughs> but uh, I'll take the good and the bad, I guess. So 1898. Look at this writing right here. I'm butchering this, this name, Leicester. Leicester Public Library Book D 55 Class 2 of 5 Mrs. M.W. Batch Live 
Bachelor Dev. what this book even is I'm not really sure honestly let's check it out okay all right all right so this is the Christian philosopher Christian philosopher of science or, oh sorry, or, you see, or, it's got an embossed stamp, stamped into this title page here, it says, or, the connection of science and philosophy with religion, which I remember it now, it's all coming back to me, I remember how uh, intrigued I was by that title, and, uh, Oh no, this just popped off. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm gonna get it now. I'm really gonna get it now. So, yeah, this page is, and I'm sure, I guess I'm not gonna flip through a lot of these, a lot of this book, because, uh, let me point it down a little more. The string or whatnot. Holding the pages together is, is coming off. I guess once the front cover comes off, it kind of unravels everything else. You can see it's So, just look at this book. That's the old library catalog, I guess. Cataloging. And I'm not knowledgeable about the Dewey Decimal System, but I know Dewey, the philosopher who invented it, wasn't writing until the late 1800s, so maybe half a century after this. So, I don't know what catalog that would be it's either 215 or 2 out of 2-5 two book D55 but uh, anyways this let's put this up here so this book is from 18, was it 30? And from those of you who watched my other video about uh, going through the book, The Geography of the Heavens, this guy wrote the foreword to that book, Thomas Dick. Clearly a man of science. author of a variety of literary and scientific communications in Nicholas Nicholson's philosophical journal, The Annals of, <laughs> of Philosophy. Sorry. I'm over here acting like a child again, guys. Can't wait till we get to draw Uranus. That's going to be fun. I'll, I'll leave any jokes that might arise out of that little section right there for you guys in the comment section <laughs> the annals of dick okay i can't help myself so this was hartford 1834 was it 1834 published by robinson and pratt and look at this so yeah this page just came off 
so we can just look at this uh, someone would have I, I, I'm guessing someone would have carved this carved this image out of wood here so and just it, it remember it's it's amazing to think about 1834 almost 200 years ago I don't think when did we discover Neptune hmm I, I think Neptune being the furthest of the gas giants, the furthest of the two ice giants, last planet before Pluto, wasn't yet discovered. I think it was in the 1850s, was it? Um, but Herschel was a famous astronomer in the 1800s, early 1800s, late 1700s, and Uranus was named after Herschel, so at that time it was still named after him because he was the one who initially discovered Uranus so doesn't roll off the tongue as much as Uranus does it Herschel I see Herschel Herschel's really gaseous, really big, really wide. It's got a big orbit. It's full of methane. Anyways, um, doesn't quite have the same punch. This was an eye. So he's analyzing, again, the connection of science and philosophy with religion. The Christian philosopher. And it's interesting to think there's still a bunch of a fair amount of Christians and other uh, people adhere adherence to other religions who practice science. And the more I learn about it, the more I realize, you know, the the moral wisdom, the ethical knowledge that comes with religion isn't necessarily incompatible with the factual um, truth about the the nature of matter and energy that science reveals so it's always interesting to especially for the historical aspect but even for the ongoing debate uh, in modern times you know here's someone's opinion on um, how they are trying to reconcile religious texts with the um, continual discoveries of science and the continual insights you know given by philosophy so this book is you know not just breaking down astronomy it's it's uh, wider than just an ast astronomical text it's also trying to Analyze the um, the optical nerves, the eyeball, and how you know light reflects off it. I think that's actually a really cool. That's like that's something I would love to get framed. That's really cool. It's just generally about you know uh, light. Figure seven. I don't know, maybe that's Venus and Mercury, perhaps. And how they uh, have different crescents at different times of the year.
be a little more gentle with it. <laughs> Let's see how we're gonna do this. figures in the upper part of the plate marked 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. represent the planets Herschel, Saturn, Jupiter, and Earth and the Moon in their relative sizes and proportions. Yeah. So, and that's pretty accurate, actually. So that's interesting. That's, that's amazing, really, actually, that they know... 200 years ago, purely based on observation, they had no electronics, no way of, you know, measuring from satellites and um, the high-tech uh, uh, telescopes, getting any sort of high-tech optics. It's purely from visual observation and calculations of the gravity and the size and the... the distance, the light, it's, it's it, the, you know, their motions, it's amazing that they'd be able to figure out the relative size, the parallax, you know, we've talked about. So, let's see, together with the telescopic views of the belts and rings of Saturn in the belts of Jupiter, meaning the bands. The two figures immediately below marked five and six, five and six right here, are intended to illustrate the description given of the eye on pages 88 through 104. In figure five, down, no, right there, still in figure five, represents a front view of the human eye. Figure six represents a section of it exhibiting the three coats and the three humors of which it is composed. Figure seven down here is a rude view, I like that use of that word, of the appearance. It's always interesting how words change. Like mean used to mean, if you were a mean person, it didn't mean you were, um, you know, not nice to people. It meant more you were just an average, kind of a dullard, you know, not very smart. I believe, at least. So, uh, figure seven represents a root view of the appearance, which the rings and moons of Saturn will exhibit in certain cases as beheld from a point 20 or 30 degrees north from his equator, see pages, pages 187 and 88, in the shade from the upper part of the ring. the view of the rings and moons of Saturn from the perspective of someone standing on Saturn that they imagine, of course. That's beautiful. I love that. The shade on the upper part of the rings represents the shadow of the body of Saturn itself as it appears in the rings about midnight. It's so interesting to think about how bright the sky would be if Earth had comparable rings like Saturn does. They would be this just perpetual glowing and how that would of course change the, uh, even though I guess they don't think, I was going to say how it changed the course of evolution, but um, I think they, they think that the rings probably shift, you know, and, and 
maybe fluctuate in and maybe uh, go away and vanish and dissipate I, I believe I've heard that they whether or not they dissipate in cycles and they come and go I don't know if that's true but I believe I've heard that they only think they're, they might be a few hundred thousand years old which on evolutionary time scales you know isn't really all that uh, long so maybe it wouldn't have affected the circadian rhythms you know making the night sky brighter but uh One thing is for sure, it would be very beautiful. So this book, let me just, uh, Christian philosopher, let's see. Yeah, so I paid $34 for this book, bought it on May 9th, 2021. In this, uh, probably, you know, about a reasonable price because it's falling apart it's very splotched so it's not in the best condition but the rest of the book other than the cover and the first few pages is still pretty uh, still pretty pretty intact so $34 not too bad for you know, really just for that beautiful plate, that picture in the front. Oh, I gotta be careful. Yeah, I can't really open it, so I feel bad. I'm, every time I turn the page, it's trying to come undone from this. binding the rope binding right here so we're not gonna mess with it much more but look at that that's so amazing look at that history it's really something it's really cool to think that that's like 200 year old thread flip through real quick and see if we could see uh, another picture there's a little diagram conduit pipes about water water pipes not too many more pictures it looks like wow I would have thought there'd be a lot a lot more pictures Really the only other diagram. So now we got one. Very, very stripped down diagram right here. Probably talking about orbits. And that's about all I see right there. Another stamp. 
of the library. And look at this. They have the actual library card still in the back here. And look at that. Let's lift it up. Let's look at this. See how many times it's been checked out. Not once. Either that or it got checked out and <laughs> never returned. I don't know. It's pretty amazing to think that someone, of course, you know, someone wrote and there are a lot of people were involved in the manufacture of the actual book itself, but just the, the handwriting, seeing the personal handwriting of someone that lived over 200 years ago. This book was in 1834. Well, I mean, at least 120 years ago. I think I saw 1898. Might have been around the time or so that this was written. The handwriting the library. Yeah, it was on the front cover, but um, it's pretty, pretty great. This book maybe kept two weeks. A fine. Two books can be had at a time and can be t obtained by card only. A fine of two cents. Two cents for each library day must be paid on each book kept over time and no books can be had while fines are unpaid the person to whom a book is charged will be held responsible for its loss or injury readers are expected to report mutilations or defacements found in any book the intentional injury of books or other property of a public library is by statute punishable by a fine or imprisonment. <laughs> Boy, what a steep pen penalty. All right. Set that back down here, and uh, I think that's that's about it for for that book right there let's pop the cover back back on there Paper, a piece of paper laid down to protect the book the cover if this stuff was giving off any sort of film or something Next one is from Rockford, Illinois. I think maybe scissors might be the best plan of attack here.
Yeah, one thing about all these, uh, all these sellers, they, they all wrap the books really nicely. So I'm gonna have to go back and definitely make a point to leave them all positive reviews. Again, I'm, I'm sorry about the band-aid guys. I know it probably looks weird, but I figured it's more pleasing to look at than a little a little boo-boo. I, I had a little plumbing repair job I had to do last minute a couple days ago and Scrape a little bark off the tree while I was cutting the pipe. Okay, let's This is this one doesn't look in uh, great condition either. Uh oh, I can already see it's coming off of my fingers there. That's not good. Let's see if we can read it. History of England, right there. Still has some of the guild on it. You can see at the bottom there. I don't know if this was part of a, uh, you know, a series. It's just one volume. Good sounds though, I can tell you that. Oh, listen to that. Let me turn that mic up. I got one mic right here, another one, the one I'm talking into is right here behind the camera, and uh, I can turn this mic up just a little bit. There's uh, lettering and words that have mostly come off right here. There's an L, it looks like. Let's see what it says in here. Book of Victor Gardner Hills. Victor Gardner Hills Family. Then right there, I don't know, you guys tell me what that says. Thomas Fair, Fairchild. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, 
So here we have a history of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar into the revolution of 1688 by David Hume. That's why I wanted this book. Written in 1811. David Hume, uh, I have not read David Hume, but he's one of the most well-known philosophers, especially that came out of England, and um, I just, I thought it was amazing to have an actual book written by him from a time published when he was still alive. I thought that was just so cool, so cool. So it is part of a volume, and this was only volume four. History of England, let's see, let's see. David Hume, I paid $20, $20.50 for this one. So David Hume was a, a 18th century English philosopher I was recently I've never read him but I've, I've read about him and um, let's see can I say anything intelligent about him? No, I don't think I can. I don't think I can. Um, he was trying to um, prioritize maybe social morality and responsibility over the over over overly rationalizing thoughts. I, I think I read that he he wrote as an example that you could uh, you could wish for the destruction of the entire world rationally in opposition to merely getting a paper cut saying that if you were about to uh, if you were omni omnipotent and you were purely logical and rational if you were about to get a paper cut then you could wish for the destruction, the ceasing of all existence, to avoid feeling the pain, you know, even however minor that that would bring. So he, anyways, he was, I think his point there was that something can be purely rational and not be in everyone's best interest even your own in that case because what would we be if we didn't have other people to share our joy with as well as support from when we were uh, suffering and feeling sorrow but anyways um, he was a I bought this book because he was a great philosopher and um I really just wanted to have uh, a bit of, really just have a bit of history, honestly. Yeah, and it's, um... Uh, a fact of history that so many great thinkers like I said were religious or you know like Newton I think is the interesting the most interesting example to point to because he's considered the father of science modern science almost and um, he was extremely religious he interpreted the he translated the Bible and he practiced alchemy he was into mysticism 
as well as hard science, and he was guided by um, metaphysical principles and, you know, he was on an adventure for understanding the world from uh, multiple perspectives at once, and it's pretty interesting that he could uh, have led to so many discoveries that so many people use to support atheistic sentiments, I guess. So the contents, here we have the contents of volume four, Henry the seventh, Henry the eighth. And I don't know if Hume was a uh, don't know if he was a, a Christian, but no doubt he would have been, according to Nietzsche, he would have been um, trying to justify his Christian morals unconsciously through his philosophy. Scotland, victory at Solway, death of James V, treaty with Scotland. And remember, this is a history uh, written by someone 200 years ago. So, this was history up until the year, you know, 1800, roughly. Alright, well, I'm going to... Uh, Go ahead and put this book down now because I'm already starting to get its cover rubbing off on my fingers, which again, I know guys, I know, I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry you have to see that, I know I should wear gloves, but someone told me that the oils in latex or even cloth isn't good either, so I don't. I don't know what to think, but although I know the book is worth more than $20, it's still only $20, so I don't know what to think about it, but let's move on to the next package now. Looks like my band-aid just fell off, so there you go. <laughs> that's, that's what I was hiding the whole time. A little paper cut, speaking of that. So, you know my stance towards the world, I guess. Alright, so this is from... El Mundo Park? I don't know what that is. Illinois, so... says it right up there. Elmwood. Is that really Elmwood? I guess so. 289 to ship this. Elmwood Park. Alright, let's see what I ordered from Elmwood Park over here. Let's find out.
Well, it's definitely not that. So I guess they were just resourceful with the packaging. No big deal there. Is a blue book that is just painter's tape. <laughs> okay. All right. I love it when there's more, when more than one layer or two. I think this is three layers at least so far. Let's see if we can get four out of it. Where's the easiest point of entry? I don't know. Let's see. Six old books in a row now, and uh, I started off with like two new ones for some reason. Interesting. But hey, I guess I said from the outset I didn't want to unbox the oldest one first, and maybe that's. <laughs> Watch it be the last. Now that's going to be funny. appreciate them in any event thank you again and I hope you enjoy orbs so this is orbs of the heavens I'm happy about this one. Oh man what look at this all right so dear Richard I thought that was just like a funny way of saying like these books are off to the people who buy them it's a whole note, though. Dear Richard, thank you for buying orbs. My late father loved books. When he passed in 1968, by the way, I sort of became a custodian of his small collection, so I've been lugging them around for over 50 years. Needless to say, my kids have zero interest in becoming a keeper, the keepers of the flame, so... I'm hoping to sell them off to people who appreciate them. In any event, thank you again. And I hope you enjoy Warps. Paul. Well, I'm, I'm glad I can't read that name because I didn't want to out you. But, I mean, that was really sweet of you, Paul. So I really appreciate that. And I'm. Highly doubtful you'll ever see this 
anyway. But um, if any of you know that gentleman, tell him thank you. And I will have to personally reach out to him and, and thank him for that sweet letter. Even though it was... Let's, let's find out here. Uh, I remember, I, and this might be one that I got from... Uh, from one of the thrift websites. No, 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 okay. Here we go, May 10th, May 10th. Clearly around <laughs> late last spring, I was having a book buying. Uh, I was binging on some books. Paid $25 for this one. Orbs, 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 orbs. Okay. Very cool. So, Mitchell's Outer Space Science Astronomy Orbs of Heaven, 1853. I bought, alright, so I bought this May of last year, 1853. And unlike the other books, this one's spine is very much intact. It doesn't have the front page, front uh, cover, I guess, but the spine is very much intact. Look at that. If I recall, hey, look at that. Speak of the devil. What does this say? No matter what might be the nature of this force. Exactly the sentiment here is control over nature in its uh, deepest secrets. It says they're trying to understand gravity, what makes the planets move, what force pulls on the planets and uh, governs their motion. It says, here was an object worthy of the highest ambition of the human mind. No matter, no matter what might be the nature of this force, whether it should reside in the sun or in the planet or in both, whether it should prove to be a property of matter or of the mere uniform manifestation of the omnipotent will, the discovery of its law of action would give to the mind the power of penetrating the darkest recesses of nature and rising to a knowledge of the profoundest secrets of the universe. Such is the nature of the investigation propounded to the powerful intellect of Newton, this eminent philosopher. Justly regarded as the most extraordinary genius that ever lived. Oh man, look at this one. This one has tons of pictures.
relative telescopic appearance of the planets. Jupiter and Saturn here are comparable in size to Venus from our vantage point. Mars and it's actually smaller than Mercury from where we stand on Earth. Oh, look at this. Here, Herschel's section of the Milky Way, page 188, Herschel's section of the Milky Way. Hmm, okay. Oh, look at that. God, look at these. The planets, Jupiter and Saturn, page 172. Comet. Here we have the Comet of 1811. The Comet of 1811. The Great Comet. Almost looks like that's like an Arab temple. Maybe that's an ancient temple. The columns and steps going up to it. I don't know. Sacrificial altar right there. Yeah, it looks like that spherical dome looks like it's somewhere in the Near East, Middle East. That's wild. So this looks like a history. Oh man, look at that. That's beautiful. Picture of Galileo. Picture of Galileo right there. Let's give you the whole view first and then I'll zoom in on it. And this is like a little protective thin, thin sheet of tissue paper to protect, protect the uh, pages from getting cross printed by the ink on the opposite page. And here we have Look at that It's a really cool drawing Lord Ross's telescope, which would have been contemporary of this book, I guess. When was this book written? Let's see, when was this book written? So look how, yeah, this was sometime in the 1800s. Look how large that telescope is relative to that tiny guy right there. It was like a 50 foot long telescope. And even the structure it's housed in is a huge undertaking. It's so impressive. 
It's awesome. So the orbs of heaven, or the planetary and stellar worlds. It looks like it's a little demonstration of, or uh, explanation of what we currently knew at that time, 1865, as we can see here. <laughs> With numerous illustrations. It's great. And a, um, a history, too, a popular exposition of the great discoveries and theories of modern astronomy. So it's like a, a tour through the discoveries of astronomy up until the mid end of the Civil War in America, at least. Now, I don't know if it's the same guy, but Mitchell, <clears throat> Mitchell was someone named Mitchell. It might be the same guy, given that he wrote a, a, a book on um, astronomy here. Was one of the first people, along with the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who proposed of the existence of black holes black hole so even 200 years ago there were people already taking the concept concept of gravity to its logical conclusion saying that you know what what would happen if matter was more and more increasingly dense densely packed into itself how dense could a planetary body get? Or a star? And if so, um, and at what density would it not be able to withstand the weight of its own gravity? It's pretty interesting to think about that. And that's how the first, you know, intimations of a black hole were developed. So the lectures, so I guess it was, a, it's probably a transcript of a series of lectures. With an appendix. Ancient and modern ideas on the system of the world list of illustrations. Plato on page 46. Let's check out Plato. Oh, the pyramids. Adam contemplating the setting. Man, there's so many good illustrations here. Look at that. Wow. Adam in the Garden of Eden with the snake right there. With a horse. A rhino, a camel, a snail. Yeah, a little snail up front. Adam contemplating the setting sun. That's beautiful, man. That is something. Plato, let's check out Plato. Hmm. It's Mars. shoulders. Okay, let's check out the pyramids. Here we go. Chaldean showing no. This is the Chaldean shepherds naming the constellations in ancient times. See, they're looking up. 
That didn't really translate too well into this book here, but still pretty cool. Or maybe they did that on purpose because it is nighttime. Near the pyramids. Let's see. Pyramids on a starry night. Look how they just formatted the text to fit fit around the image. Man, this writing is really poetic. Let's listen to this. Here we pause. We have closed the enunciation of the great problem whose discussion and solution lie before us. A problem whose solution has been in progress 6,000 years. One which has furnished to man the opportunities of his loftiest triumphs. one which has taxed in every age the most vigorous efforts of human genius, a problem whose successive developments have demonstrated the immortality of mind, and whose sublime results have vindicated the wisdom and have declared the glory of God. You have listened to the Annunciation. We now invite you to follow us in the demonstration. And may that almighty power which built the heavens give to me wisdom to reveal and to you power to grasp the truths and doctrines wrested by mind from nature in its long struggle of sixty centuries of toil. And they emphasize that with a statue, a picture of a statue of Newton at Cambridge University. This is this is actually a book I would love to sit down maybe with gloves and read. Lecture one is the exposition of the problem which the heavens present for solution. The discoveries of the primitive ages, theories for the explanation of the motions of heavenly bodies, discovery of the great laws of motion and gravitation, and then universal gravitation applied to the explanation of the phenomena of the solar system, the stability of the planetary system, the discovery of new planets, the cometary world, comets, a scale on which the universe is built, in the motions and revolutions of fixed stars, with an appendix. Not every day you see a book end like that. The end. Look at that, the Crab Nebula. As seen through Lauren Ross's telescope. If I happen to, I hope I don't skip over this in editing, but uh, no, now I'm putting pressure on myself. It'd be cool to juxtapose some of these with modern images. And there, the Great Nebula in Orion. Constellation Lyra, the Whirlpool Nebula, a 
A lot of these might be the same ones from Burritt's Geography of the Heavens. Tycho Brahe's house. Look at that. Yeah, what a great book for twenty five dollars. I encourage you guys to go out and find some books like that. Find some books. Okay, so so far we got one, two, three, four, five, six old books in a book to help us decipher what they mean psychologically. Okay, next up is what do we got next here? We have, oh, I thought I covered it up and it's just really faded. It is. From Montgomery, Illinois. We got a lot of books from Illinois. Interesting, it turns out. was such a nice letter. That really was. I really liked that. That was so sweet. Man. His father died in 1968. I mean, he could have been born in the 40s or in the early 1900s. Who knows? Let's put that in there. Let's dive into this one. Infatuated by it. I liked the, um, I rented the 50 psychological, psychology classics from my library, and uh, I thought this would be a great book as well to uh, get my feet wet in some philosophy. list right here. David Hume, Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding in 1748. Wow, he was, he was an early 1700s, 18th century writer. I didn't realize he was that early. I thought he was the late 1800s. Hmm. Here's a list of all the other books they got. Prosperity Classics, Self-Help, Spiritual Success. Yeah, Philosophy and Psychology. I don't know, it just seems like such a, a useful thing to let someone curate what they find the most useful. And then from there, it seems like a good jumping off point. So, okay. Well, that was a quick one. What do we got next? What do we got next? All right. Here we go. We got a shiny package here, guys. Check it out. From Bellevue, Washington. What? Oh, I, th I think I opened this one up already. This 
might not be a surprise. Probably save that packaging. Animated nature. So this one looks like it's in really good shape. Look at that. You can see that it's got very few bits removed from it. Let me try to avoid that glare. Here, hold on, let me adjust this. There we go, all right. See, it's got some rips, clearly creases from use. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Volume three in an history of Earth and animated nature. <laughs> I don't know what accent that was. So this is like a history of geology and biology, I guess. I'm not really sure. So we got two C's, MDCC, 1700, 50, 76. That's why I wanted this book. This book was printed during the American Revolution. How amazing is that? 
apparently printed for James Williams, whoever that is. And here on ruminating animals, the contents. Quadrupeds of the cow kind, the buffalo, the animals of the sheep and goat kind. Yeah, so it's a bunch of animals. Um, I'm, you know, this is volume whatever, so volume three. So I assume volumes one and two might have traversed the earth. This is more about the animals. I thought. Uh, uh. Oh no. Yikes. A piece of the spine just came off on my hand. That's terrible. That sucks. But I do have glue, so I'll be able to glue that back on. I bought, a while ago, I bought some special book glue that you can use to uh, specifically glue it back on. It's too bad. Man. You guys can see it came off right there. It sort of looks like under. But I got this book because it was written or published in 1776, printed, and I thought it was interesting to see the, to hear about the uh, perspective on animals back then. For instance, the buffalo, like we just saw. Let's see if there's any pictures. was hunted almost nearly to extinction in America and uh, you know back when this book was written that probably probably wasn't even the uh, on their radar thinking that they would ever go extinct because there were so many buffalo roaming the continental US Here we have the polecat. Is that a weasel? A ferret? A polecat. Interesting. I don't know what this is. The civet? Any uh, biologists out there? Tell me what the heck that thing is. Look at that thing. <laughs> what is that? A civet. C I V E T. C I V E T. Looks like it's in somewhere tropical based on the leaves, the trees, the background. Really interesting, so. Alright. What else do we got? The polecat. What do we got here? The hyena. The hyena. Whoopi Goldberg. That's who voiced one of the hyenas in The Lion King. In case you guys were confused why I just randomly said Whoopi Goldberg. Guy in the hyena.
the fox, the wolf. So interesting. <laughs> Look at that face of the wolf. It's a little gnarly. What's going on there? Looks like a Picasso. The fox. I <laughs> read. I read a meme the other day. Someone said, uh, if you haven't checked out that next door app, it's just a bunch of people saying they think they saw a fox. <laughs> and I've been on there, and that's kind of true. It's true enough to be funny, at least. What are these animals? The Siagu, the Siagush, Siagush, the lynx, the lynx, the lynx. The male panther, look at the panther there. The tiger. It doesn't look quite right, but oh well. It's what you get when you don't have any photographs to reference. I guess. The cougar. These animals look hungry. <laughs> what is this divine animal with the sunlight peeking through it, shining down upon? Barbarossa, Barbarossa. It's a lot of extra vowels in there. I feel like don't belong. It's got hooves, so that's a hog of some sort. Interesting. It's got a really long tail. It's like really tall and skinny. And then next to it we have Cabiapi, Cabi Eye, Cabi Eye. I like how they're all like standing on, like perched on pretty little plateaus. A little miniature banks. Man, I do not know any of these animals' names. That's hilarious. This one must be a nuisance on farms. It's standing next to a broken down fence. We have some little, little village in the background. The peccary. Never heard of that, I don't think. Sorry, my, <laughs> my voice got really raspy there. The uh hog -huh. has been transplanted into America. I love how they used to write their S's. To America. Unless it was at the end of a word, and then they would just make it a normal S. I don't understand. If it's at the beginning, it looks like an F. But if it's at the end, the beginning or the middle, it looks like an F. But it's just weird. I wonder, I'm sure there's some whole history behind that. Hogs been transplanted into America and suffered to run wild among the woods. It's often f seen <laughs> to, to 
herd among a drove of peccaries, but never to breed from them. Maybe that was a, a native type of hog in America. They may therefore be considered as two distinct creatures. The hog is the larger, more useful animal, the peccary is more feeble and local. The hog subsists. Man, that's a mouthful if you're looking at F's, f -f -f's in most parts of the world, in, in almost every climate. The peccary is a native of the warmer regions and, can and cannot subsist in ours without shelter and assistance. It's more than probable, however, that we could easily, we could readily propagate the breed of this quadruped and that in two or three generations it might be familiarized to our climate. But as it is inferior to the hog in every respect, so it would be needless to admit, look at that, even there, look at that example, needless, to admit a new domestic whole, a new domestic whose services are better supplied in the old world. Animal husbandry. Nowadays, taken very literally by some people. So, yeah, so, so a lot of these books are probably going to be the last time I really truly open them because stuff like that happens. That's too bad. Oh well. It's pretty, still pretty, uh, pretty well intact though. It's very nice. I just love these books. I absolutely adore these books. These things are so cool to touch and browse through. Alright, next book. Our next book is from Southeastern Massachusetts. Bend sticker on there. This looks like a little comic book haul I got, so it's an interesting little, uh, little break in our routine here. This is, uh, so here we have, from April 1994, The Dark Knight, Night Quests, Batman, Legends of the Dark Knight. Part one of three. Dennis O'Neill, Ron Wagner, Ron McCain. This one is Batman from September nineteen ninety three. Nightfall, 17. Approved by the Comic Code Authority, apparently. I know, comic book reviewers, look at the edges. Look at the edges. Make sure they're in 
good condition. Anyways, again, I'm not a collector. I, th I just think it's, uh, it'll be cool, you know, in 20 years to look back and have something that's like 50 years old, maybe, 96, Legends of the Dark Knight. And I, I don't know how much these are worth, but, uh, let's see what I paid for this little lot. Chicho was, again, the one who is very knowledgeable about he's a comic book connoisseur quite literally and he uh he encouraged me to in you know indirectly to collect or at least start a little collection add to my my little collection i already had Could have sworn. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I got it from this one. Up top. Yeah, okay. This is the most recent one. Wow, look at that. Ordered on June 13th, 2021. So, literally a year and one day ago. Because it's the next day now. So, exactly a year ago. Alright. Got more Dark Knight. This looks like a Oh, there's two. 94, buck 75. Looks like Batman's in a wheelchair. I don't know. I know nothing about the lore of Batman. Quarry part three of three, so I guess that goes with this. At least we got one and three. Oh no, my mistake. We got part two right here. So we got one, two, and three right there. Okay, right. Think of Dr. Evil. Okay. And then what the hell is this? I don't know what kind of demon Batman that thing is. Is that what Batman turns into? An actual bat? That's hilarious. <laughs> Alright. package. I think I actually might have opened this one as well. So. This one's from Columbus, Ohio. pop one of those. Alright, this one is... Oh, another copy of the Orbs of Heaven. I think I was so enthralled by the book, the actual contents of the book, that I, uh, I was looking for another one that's... that was intact, at least. Let's see. Let me get something I can put the book on.
from eBay. It's got my name, so I won't show the whole thing, but $31, $6 shipping. Thanks. Okay, so I actually, well, I stand corrected. This one. Yeah, yeah, so this was the $25 one, actually. I said the other one was 25 bucks. It turns out, I guess because the cover was missing, man, I would have paid that guy $20 easily for this. Because look at the difference in the spine. This one's all just a cloth embossed. This one's actual leather. You can see the difference. So I think I got this one because it looked nice. And then this one here. Although it looks like I'm about to break the darn cover off, so. Yikes. I gotta be careful with that. I actually only paid apparently a dollar fifty for this book. So that's insanely cheap. It's missing a cover, yeah, but nothing else it's in such good condition too so I, I'm gonna have to personally go back and thank that guy especially for the the handwritten note that he left in there Yeah, so and we already looked at this, so I won't go into it anymore, but uh, it's very, very cool, especially all the plates, all the pictures that were in it. of Chaldean shepherds or you know an illustration naming the constellations yet it says the names are fixed to these different groupings but when and where and by whom we know not so someone decided to say look at that contradiction that's funny all right so let's put that in and looks like we already have our next candidate.
so for this one it was a um <laughs> it's a relatively new book but this is a very famous astronomer Plumian professor of astronomy and experimental philosophy at Cambridge nature of the universe. Um, this was really just another book. This wasn't really a collector's or anything. This was another book I kind of wanted to just gauge. It's got pictures here. The status of our knowledge about the universe, really. You know, the title, Frontiers of Astronomy, conveyed the, the cutting-edge knowledge that it contains at that time. Let's see, it doesn't have black holes, I wonder. It should. It should say something about them, at least. That would be an interesting chapter. Or the, the taproot. The galaxy as a magnet. Astronomical distances. This book I paid a dollar fifty six for. It's probably about how much it cost when they, with inflation, when it first came out. <coughs> anyway, let's see. Black hole, black hole, black hole. No black hole. I don't see black holes right there. Interesting. Interesting. Evolution of mixed stars. Well, that'll be for another episode, I guess. I do want to do an episode on um, just general the basics of black holes even though I probably won't even be able to understand that much but um, yeah I just want to do uh, an overview on black holes because they're fascinating and I've been meaning to do one about the M87 black hole so I'd like to get around to that Alright, I think this might be the last one that I've pre-opened. Didn't want you guys to think I was, again, pulling your leg too much. This one is from Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, I'm going to be real careful with this one. Look at that. glimmerings of some old guild guilt gilding very neat
astronomy. Eighteen forty six. I remember this was a interesting book because it was the textbook. It says in the introduction to astronomy designed as a textbook for the students of Yale College. of crater at the bottom represented. It's the best that they could see at that time. And there's Jupiter in his moons. The moon five days into a waning or no waxing moon Saturn and his rings right there I hear you I hear you buddy 1846 I thought that was pretty cool so that's, what would the math be on that? So 46 to 22 is 24, 22, it's 22, 24 years old, yeah. So 100 and uh, 180, um, 176 years old. Best guess I'm moving onward. Analysis designed for a basis in review as a basis in re for review and examination. This would be quite the interesting book to, um, you know, browse through and see how much I know. Probably not very much. That's not too bad. The hour being given at any place to tell what hour it is at any other part of the world. I don't know. Maybe that's more difficult than I'm thinking. Probably is. There's parallax.
representing the phases of the moon right there. Probably a newer one, I think. Beaufort, South Carolina. Nested packages. All right, my favorite. Job for the razor. This is not. This definitely does not feel like a new book. Nice. A pictorial history of Greece. Yes. All right. All right. Look at that. That's a big boy. focus it's too big to focus look at that the history of Greece a pictorial history of Greece I loved this one the idea that the idea that I could make some videos and have pictures to go along with the history of Greece in mind Originally written in 1839. Let's see how old this edition is. Doesn't say on the front page here, but... Uh, is The History of Greece by Thomas Knightley or Keatley Keatley to which is added a chronological table of contemporary history by Joshua Toolman Smith author of Comparative View of Ancient History and Explanation of Chronological Eras New York Levitt and Allen, number 379, Broadway. We have a picture up here. Oh, sorry. This book's a lot bigger than the other ones, the previous books, so. Battle of Plateau. Plateau. Battle of Plateau 129. So it's 
seems like it's from the year 1839. I paid... What did I buy this book for? What did I buy this book for? $50. So, I paid a little more than I did for some of these other books here. Some of the other books there. Um, I think just because it had so many really cool pictures. And I'm getting so interested in history. So, maybe I shouldn't have paid that much. I don't know. It's almost, you know, 180 years old though, so for me it's 190 almost. It's pretty cool. I think it's, I think it's a worthwhile investment, at least, personally. We got Zeus. These recordings have been running into the afternoon in, in South Florida here in the summertime, July 14th. It's always almost like clockwork, between 2 and 4, you get some afternoon thunderstorms. Zeus wakes up. We have a description of Greece, the original state. They break it up and I guess to aristocratic period. The And then the democratic period. Then the monarchic period, I guess, when Greece began going downhill. Or at least lost its cultural battle in the, uh, when Rome started casting its longer shadow over Greece. Alexander the Great. Yeah, man, I'm so I I want to learn so much more about the Jewish history and the uh, the narratives that center you know the Bible is centered around in ancient Greek and Roman history and even Egyptian and Babylonian. Mesopotamian history going further yeah further back in time than that because it's just such all those are the cultures out of which our western civilization has sprung and been inspired and influenced by so uh, I just feel like there's so much to learn about our culture to be able to be an effective, you know, person and, and to understand the movements and the ideas that were unconsciously assuming and reacting against sometimes. So I just I thought why not why not read what they had to say about it, you know, two hundred years ago and there's some cool pictures to go along with it. That's a bonus. The Parthenon. But for our purposes today, let's just uh, Check out some pictures. Here's Sparta.
ancient Persian soldiers. Reception of the Persian heralds. Greeks don't look too pleased. The Battle of the Marathon right there. Is that the one uh, before or after the 300 Spartans died? Look at them. Here's an interesting example of the mixture of African and, you know, early European, or at least Greek, Hel Hel Hellenistic peoples. The Athenian fleet in five triremes from Eritrea soon arrived at Miletus. Being joined by the Milesians, proceeded to Ephesia, e e Ephesus. So, it's interesting. Um, you know, we were, uh, we, uh, yeah, ancient so societies and civilizations were interacting in interracial so much more than we are nowadays. Um, I feel like race wasn't even a thing. You're black. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure there were uh, early forms of of uh, discrimination against people of skin tones that differed from your own, but. Um, definitely wasn't outright it was more of a class status I feel like slaves could uh, work their way up and people could be sold free free men could be people could be sold into slavery so ancient Grecian soldier Looks almost uh, Native American, Mayan or something. Look at that. The city, the city plan of Athens, wow. The Ruins of Tyre. The Ruins of Tyre. Alexander the Great entering Babylon. mid 30s that's just so unreal to think he conquered thousands of miles 
of territory before he drank himself to death. Well, okay. Does that fit up there? It does. Look at that. All right. It fits right there. All right. What else we got? All right. So that was the last of the uh, small packages. I have three, no, four, four larger boxes and three um, maps, which either maps or, or they call folios, like pages from, from books, just single pages, I guess. Okay. So we are nearing the end. Thank God, some will say. Okay. I guess it's been sitting on the shelf for a year or so. They probably didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> this is so much fun. This is, uh, it's just so funny. Like, I forgot what I even bought, so... It is Christmas in July. That's for sure. Alright, look at this. A little stain up top, no big deal. I've seen worse. We'll tear on the back, the edges. It's got a little rip. But look at this, guys. I guess that's the top. Look at this. So this book, um, this box set is four books, different uh, philosophers broken in, thinkers and philosophers broken into um, the speculative, the political, the philosophers of science, and the social philosophers. You have man, of course, meaning hum humanity, man in spirit, man in the state, man in the universe science, man and man, um, the social, the social realm, Again, this is my, uh, this kind of an addiction, and I need to stop, I really do. I need to slow down a lot, because I buy books way, like, seriously, way quicker than I read them. I haven't read books I bought ten years ago, you know, so. I, I really want to learn philosophy, and I'm sure once I actually start really reading it, I'm going to, uh, Wish I, I hadn't, but I just want to challenge myself, and more than that, I want to challenge myself in a meaningful, to me, domain, and that's 
learning how to think and to learn how to think I think I think I need to understand or at least try to understand some of the most <clears throat> some of the most profound speakers thinkers writers I, I I think I need to understand the most profound humans that have left their legacy to us, at least in the West. And maybe uh, maybe in the East too, I think. There's writings from the Upanishads in here. Yeah. So, I like this because it is wisdom, not just from the West, but from the East too. Got the Upanishads, which I've read that before actually. Augustine Aquinas, the Dialogue with Death, Brahmana, the Bhagavad Gita. Spinoza, Pascal, I mean, again, another excerpt from Hume here. Berkeley, Kant, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, William James. I mean, these are the most profound thinkers. And, you know, based on the little bit of reading I've done, I've realized that you know, if I'm ever gonna, if I'm ever gonna grow as a person, I need to let, not reinvent the wheel, even though I couldn't even do that if I wanted to, but it's just foolish not to expose yourself to what wisdom and knowledge and insights previous, you know, geniuses of thought have, you know, taken pains to write down and leave the world so um, and a great place to start is where people think uh, where there's been a general consensus about where knowledge lies and that's often in great books great literature great philosophy great breakthroughs in science and the wisdom buried within the parables and myths of religious texts, you know. So the political philosophers, let's see. Hobbes, Locke, Mill, Rousseau, Thoreau, Adam Smith, Hegel, and Marx. So we're going to see Francis Bacon in here, I bet. Maybe even Roger Bacon, who knows. The Novum Organum, Lucretius, Copernicus, Descartes, Comte. That guy is an interesting guy. I've, I've only heard of him through... Uh, Michael, Dr. Michael Sugru's lectures on YouTube, but um, he, he was a polymath for sure. He was trying to come up with a theory of everything. Bergson, Darwin, Freud, Whitehead. Never heard of this guy. I have never heard. I have never heard of him. James Jeans. Wow, interesting. And then lastly,
we have this is ethics how to treat you know other people reflections on yourself would be more I guess how to understand yourself and that would be the deepest type of philosophy I think but um this is really the core of morality and ethics is you know the questions of how how do you interact and view other people we have Aristotle Plato Epicurus Epictetus Aurelius Confucius Montaigne lots of Montaigne Emerson and John Dewey so uh, I think I pretty paid a pretty penny for this yeah no I didn't look at that that's awesome I paid 20 bucks for this guys five dollars a book that's a steal that's so amazing and I bought it on 420 last year sweet all right This one is from Ohio again. Man, lots of lots of goodies in Ohio. Apparently. So, uh, that was loud, but let's find out what these are. <laughs> I completely forgot. packaged really nicely. These are packaged nicely.
Wow, so uh, these, let's see how much these were. This is a, well, it's an ancient history series. Um, there was one in here I paid. So there's a 1767 astronomy book we have yet to unbox that I paid an exorbitant amount for. I will tell you guys when we come up to that one. Let's see, did I buy this one? Okay, so I paid fifty dollars for this one too. So I paid fifty for the history of Greece. And then this one too. Volumes two and three of eight. I paid fifty dollars, so you know, twenty-five a piece, which really given that it was two books, is not that bad. They're purchased on May 9th. May 9th. Look at that. Look at these old books. Is that dust? I think it is. I think that's literally dust. is volume two. Let's check it out. Let's check it out. It's got a note in here. Number 71. Mentor. Library book. Returnables. January, April, July, and October. What? <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> I just noticed it's got a dead fly right there. Look at that. That's funny. No big deal. Someone just killed a fly with a book. This is why I bought this book. It's got a map. 1819. Look at that. 1819. Let's move this. Okay, how do I do this? Is this in the book? Yes, it is. Yeah, this is why I bought this book right here. By M. Rollin, late principal of the University of Paris. Translated from the French in eight volumes. This is volume two. A new 
who sit on maps. 203-year-old map. How cool is that? All the way from Turkey, Asia Minor. The Euxin Sea. I've never, I never knew it used to be called that. The Euxin Sea. Well, the Arabian Gulf. Hmm. They don't even bother labeling the Mediterranean. I guess it's just a, a given. That is so cool. That is so cool. It says, it says here the uh, the map is to explain the history of the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, and the Medes, Medes, I don't know, Medes and Persians, including Alexander's expedition. Alexander's expedition. So cool. Okay. I'm going to close this just in case I do something. Just before I rip it or something. Okay. There we go. Got that done. So it contains the Carthaginians, the Assyrians, Cyrus, Babylon by Cyrus, taking of Babylon by Cyrus. Check out the other book now. Nice. Let's see Paul Allen's book. <laughs> I love that meme. I feel like I sound like him sometimes. That's kind of weird. Uh, reference that. <laughs> Anyways. The sick reference, bro. This is volume three, so. We have another map. Okay, so this is, uh, let's check it out. This is from. Content 
contents is uh, Persians and Grecians. So this isn't, you know, a whole lot of good on its own, but again, this is mainly just for historical value in the map. The map is the coolest part, probably. It's like the map might be pinned right there. the same. Okay, so this is a, a close-up of Turkey. Asia Minor here, so Asia Minor. The Expedition of Cirrus and the Retreat of the Ten Thousand. Babylon. really cool. excited about that. I really like the, uh, the map in that one. Volume 2, especially. Alright, guys. <clears throat> uh, we are winding down to the final packages. And, um, trying to see which one. Okay, I think this last 
we have one more box and then three uh, maps or folios, pages, leaves, and that's it. So I think this last box is the the big spender. <laughs> it's uh, it's as much as all of these other books combined. So let's find out if it is. And I think it was worth it. I still do. I'll stand by my purchase. Let's check it out. Actually, this is such a big box. I need to rearrange this real quick. Okay, so I'm back. Washed my hands for the most part. And let's, let's crack this baby open. Why don't we? This is like VHS tape, cassette tape. That's strange. Just gonna have to go left to here. This one, this box is too big to rotate. paid the absolute most for. I paid $350 for this book. $350. That was actually, I was in a bidding war with someone. That's, that's why I paid so much. Let's see, the exact amount actually is, what was it? 345 I got a deal. <laughs> Yeah, this book, um, honestly, I was kind of nervous that I paid that much for it, but, uh, again, I think it's an investment, and I'm actually really nervous to even open this thing. You can see... the amount that I paid for my other astronomy books. So, I'm a little more cautious with this one here. Look at that old book, though. God. Binding. This thing is from the 1700s. I, I can't put into words how neat it is, how awesome, and just how awestruck I am right now, thinking about the history, where this has been, the shelves, the homes it's been in, the shelves it's sat on, the hands that have touched it. See, 
ASMR that's been made from it. <laughs> Man, so cool. History of astronomy, Costard's history of astronomy. We got the leather binding, leather spine with the golden gilt on it. So happy with this. Just look at it. Look at it from here. It's got the. You couldn't replicate that in a movie if you tried. I don't think. Or it would take a long time. Maybe 300 years. To me, that's just so cool. See, I'm nervous to even open that. You can see the spine is just like, mm, no. Man. You can open it maybe like this. Let's check it. See if we can see the, uh, See the date on this? Check it out here. I'm sure there's a really cool picture in front. History of astronomy with its application to geography, history, and chronology. Occasionally exemplified by the globes. So it got Greek right there. By George Custard, the Custard M.A. Vicar of Twickenham in Middlesex. London, printed by James Lister, a little Boswell Court, and sold by J. Newberry at the Bible and Sun in St. Paul's Churchyard. 17, let's see, 1767, yeah, 1767, oh sorry, you guys can't see, right there, you know what, for this one I'm going to have to bring the camera to this. Is that 1500 100 150 10 5 1 in 1 1767 1767 here's my whole setup in case you guys were wondering right now <sighs> yeah the books over there and there's all the trash Ernie, Ernie's on the other side of the bed there. And do, 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 do. there's all my other trash, and that's the last of the uh, packages over there.
Look how big that type is compared to my hand. It's massive. Cleomedes? Cleomedes. Hmm. It says the Cleomedes, an author but little known, is supported to, is supposed to have wrote not long before the beginning of the Christian era his treatise called the Cicleotheria. It's divided into two parts. treats of the doctrine of the sphere as it was taught in his time in the second of the periods of the planets. The magnitude of the sun and the moon, their distances from the earth and their eclipses. Hmm. It says this treatise this treatise may be looked upon as the foundation of all our present geography and astronomy, and is extracted, as he acknowledges himself, from the writings of Pythagoras, Eratosthenes, Hipparchus, and Poseidonius, names well known and greatly celebrated. So, <clears throat> 1767, that means that this book is 300, no, sorry, oh, so that's a close-up and a half there, isn't it? Um, and, uh, 250 years old, something like that. Babylonians, the Egyptians, wow, what, according to Tully, The Babylonians, according to Tully, boasted of their having observed the heavens for 470,000 years. What? Theodorus Sicilus, Sicilus says 473,000 years. 
but the Chaldeans accurately observed the risings and settings of the stars. Oh, but here's in that from the Temple of Belus, which was built very high. But as he acknowledges it, this building was... But as he acknowledges that this building was in ruins at this time, and that the authors were not agreed in their accounts concerning it, all that he says on it, and the observations made there, must be looked upon only as hearsay. Man, I cannot wait to read this book. This is really amazing. This is really amazing. History of Astronomy from Thales to Alexander the Great. They hadn't even discovered um, Herschel or Uranus when this book was written. binding any more than we already have, you know, than I have to right now. I could show you guys the leather binding on these books, but uh, this is, for me, it's just like, it's the history that really gets me so much. God, that's so cool. That is amazing. So amazing. The embossing right there on the edges. level of detail that went into uh, the ordinary books is astounding. Looks such a piece of history. All right, let's open up our last packages. This has been a long one, but uh, I'm excited. We're going to be looking at even further in history, guys. Going even further back. Going even further back now. Okay. I gotta go put this somewhere safe. So, um, I know one of these is actually a magazine written by Meme Analysis and his girlfriend, so, uh, maybe, maybe it'll be this one, but, uh, I wanted to support them, I think, doing art and doing a magazine and, or no, sorry, it's a comic, 
Or maybe it's a, uh, a magazine that's a compendium of comics. I'm not really sure. But I just like what he's doing on his channel, so I wanted to support it. This is from 1832, and this, uh, I got this because it was a, I think it was a, a review of some sort of the one of the first computers ever. Let's check it out. There's a man named Charles Babbage, and so this is, uh, I like the concept behind this magazine. The Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. 1832 here. Hey look, Francis Bacon popping up again. This looks like a uh, um, review of a book by Charles Babbage. Babbage wrote something uh, generally just a uh, a breakdown of the principles of the 1800s steam engine technologies and all the the various areas um, like the printing press and clothing. Um, household goods, manufacturing, and with each item, he used that item, they said, in here, to highlight the different branches of each principle. They had an interesting thing here about the word manufacture, which they say means fabrication by the hand which has be become so singularly inapplicable to the thing which it is used to denote. The human hand now performs but a comparatively small part in most of those processes to which the name of manufacturers is given. And in some of the most stupendous and wonderful of them, its aid is hardly at all employed. The uh, aid of the hand it says where where the steam engine plies its mighty energies man has in many cases little more to do than look on if the expression of a manufacturing company were to be taken in its literal sense as meaning a country where the articles were generally made by the hand it would be much more truly applicable to spain or russia or poland or hindustan or indeed uh, any other country on earth than to ours, meaning England. England.
in any history of the computer, Charles Babbage is one of the original in, in innovators and inventors of the um, you know the use of binary logic, basically in machines to do mechanical calculations. So it's pretty happy to have that. What did I pay for this one? Let's see. What did I pay for this one? Um, Fifteen ninety-five. Yeah. The economy of machinery. The economy of machinery was the book, I think. Okay, this next one here, let's see what we got. A wax seal. It is. Look at that. Wow, that's really neat. Talk about history. That's awesome. on YouTube. This is meme analysis. He goes by the God Disc on Instagram. Black Sun. I don't want to read all of this on here, but uh, I want to shout out Chris. I guess he's the only other person I've had on this channel, um, as far as like an interview. And uh, as I get larger, I'd like to, um, as I have more opportunity to uh, talk to other people, I'd like to continue to talk to, um, you know, use that to, to push my, my knowledge, and, um, yeah, really just get to connect with interesting people on the internet, and this is certainly one of them. 
So they have him and his girlfriend, I guess, have a. Uh, this is from again last year. I bought all of this. They have a. is a collection of different comics. Maybe that's... Maybe, uh, no, I guess that's, that's art in itself. just uh, cool to support people doing unique, genuine art. I couldn't tell you what, you know, half of this probably means. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to interpret a lot of it, but it's interesting. And that's a hallmark of, it's at least one hallmark of good art, isn't it? This is a really well made book like material wise too, so shout out to them, meme analysis. Well guys, I, uh, I had an idea that this might be the treasure we were after, but um, it's pretty nice that it ended up being the last package we had to open here. Look at that, the oldest package out of our hall here is from the oldest city in North America. city here. The Bible. This Bible map is guaranteed to be a genuine, from a genuine original 19, 1723 King James Version Bible. A rare treasury of Christian history, folio Roman front, font Lon London, by Michael Wallen. Mike's books, books and coins. Bibles, books and coins. I'm getting getting tired. Alright, guys. I want... Let's see, how much did I pay for this one? $60. This one here. $60 here. Okay. Sacred geography taken from the Old and New Testaments containing most of, most of, I don't know what that means, but E-Y, most of the then known parts of the world.
and by whom peopled. Let's see here, it says, I can't see that up there. Says Genesis Chapter One. And there we go, Pontus Euxinus again. The Black Sea is Euxinus. I wonder if that's a word for black. Egypt, the Red Sea. This looks like a Lord of the Rings map here. Which is uh, apparently not a coincidence because J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian, a scholar, and an Englishman who wanted a mythology for his own people. And so, although it was clearly fiction, he wanted a mythology that would represent the values of the English people. That's why it's not a coincidence. The English people came from Europe who were, you know, um, What's the word? I don't know. Europe is on the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean actually means Middle Earth. Mediterranean. Middle Earth. So this is the sea of the Middle Earth. just interesting to me that uh, we didn't even study or know much about ancient history until, you know, the early 1600s, 1700s in the West. And now we know so much. That this map... 300 years old just blows my mind it's really something special
Well, there you have it, guys. And they even, I just spotted this down here. The encampments of the Israelites in the desert being led by Moses for 40 years out of Egypt. That's amazing. Well, thanks for joining me on this journey. This was uh, really fun to open all these books and maps. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again to all my Patreon supporters. I know I don't shout you guys out enough, but it really means the world that you guys go out of your way to donate to the channel and support everything I'm doing over here. So. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your love and support. And uh, see you next time, guys.